In, in speaking truth to power, Alan Wildowski argued that the pathology of healthcare policy is that the past successes of medicine are likely to lead to future failures in healthcare policy. For, he argued, as life expectancy increases only partly as a result of medicine, a nation's healthcare system is faced with, is faced with an older population whose ailments are more difficult to treat, sending the costs of treatment ever higher, while each improvement in health and medicine becomes more expensive than the last. It is the doing better, feeling worse syndrome, which in the end, Wildowski argued, will also undermine principles of solidarity since, and I love this quote, the rich don't like waiting, the poor don't like high prices, and those in the middle tend to complain about both. Now, he wrote this in 1979, and he reflected, of course, on the US healthcare system, but his pathological law also holds, I think, for European healthcare systems. By emphasizing complete health, complete physical, mental, and social well-being as the gold standard of our healthcare systems and our welfare state, we cause public spending on healthcare to spill to unsustainable levels, crowding out investments in other socially valued domains, education, for example. In our desperate attempts to contain the rising healthcare expenditures, we've put all our hopes on rationing and efficiency-enhancing measures facilitated by ut utilitarian decision-making frameworks and supported by the results of evidence-based medicine and randomized controlled trials. And in our desperate search for the Holy Grail, we search for uh, 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 evidence-based policy interventions. But unfortunately, the frameworks that we use to govern our healthcare systems are still of little help in making the social optimal choice between curative treatments on the one hand and investments in prevention or investments in capacitating social services on the other hand. The problem is, I think, that these frameworks not only deny the interdependency of health-related health related risks to other social risks, but also the fact that it becomes more and more difficult to make the right moral choices with respect to health within one coherent and consistent set of philosophical arguments. So to sum up, the fundamental sources of the challenge that I wish to bring forward tonight are first the rise of cognitive, normative, and strategic uncertainty that comes along with the emergence of new social risks that do not fit adequately within the social insurance arrangement precisely because of their unknown magnitude. And secondly, the cognitive, normative, and strategic uncertainty that comes along with accelerating innovations in medical science. Both sources of uncertainty not only disrupt our understanding of the present and the future, but also our ideas of social order. So we are doomed to juggle with different frames of knowledge and justice when it comes to health. And the only way out of this dilemma, I guess, is that we modify our standard of what good health is or ought to be. And this also asks for another approach to the way we govern our health systems. In their groundbreaking article in the British Medical Journal, our Dutch colleague, Machtelt Huber, and her co-authors suggested an alternative approach towards health one that can be operationalized and adapted to local and situational circumstances. Health, she argued, should not be defined as a complete well-being, but as the capacity to adapt and manage, self-manage when dealing with the social, physical, and mental challenges in the life course. And in contrast to the complete health standard, this definition is both dynamic and situational in the sense that it emphasizes health as being a dynamic balance between opportunities and limitations, shifting through the life course and affected by external conditions, such as social and environmental conditions. An aging population, for example, not only demands other types of care, but also other types of housing and supporting social and community care. By successfully adapting to an illness, people not only feel better, but they are also able to work or to, particip or to participate in social activities and feel healthier despite limitations. And this approach, I think, is promising, since it opens up new areas for investments and interventions outside the medical sector that may contribute in a positive way to our health, but that are currently not recognized for this. And by doing so, reciprocity is brought into the interrelatedness between health and its social and physical determinants. In other words, the health as a capacity approach, as I call it, has more potential to realign the domains of public health and medical care with other domains of the welfare state and other models for solidarity. And although its exact meaning is open to debate, we can find many examples in contemporary social policy discourses in various contexts that emphasize the importance of investing more in citizens' cap capacities to adapt and self-manage, instead of relying on curative treatments, repair, and insurance. 
It relates, for example, to the health and all policies approach of the, the, uh, the World Health Organization and its plea for a whole of society approach. It also opens do the door for investments in capacitating services inside and outside the health sector that support people in managing their health and life more effectively. Think of the interrelatedness of health and social care or the current emphasis on integrated care. In the European context, it has clear affinities with the social investment state or related concepts all introduced in the 1990s and 2000s. And on a more philosophical level, there is a link with SANS and uh, Nussbaum's capability approach. And when it comes to governance, it fits within a more pragmatist approach towards health and its determinants, including another configuration of health services, another conception of governance that could be labeled as experimentalist governance. And experimentalist governance goes far beyond the minimalist preoccupation with efficiency and competition. It also goes beyond nudging, Adam. It emphasizes the need to invest in a governance infrastructure of monitoring and forward-looking accountability that facilitates mutual learning about the wicked problems that we have to deal with. To be sure, health as a capacity is in many ways surrounded with ambiguity and ambivalence. Its social, political and policy consequences can hardly be overseen. It blurs in many ways the boundaries between medical care, public health and other social systems. So the challenge is how and to what extent this health as a capacity approach can be further developed within a policy making context. And I hope that in the next 10 years, HEPL is one of the platforms or fora where we can explore and discuss the consequences of this new approach towards health. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to uh, suggest uh, one celebration and four challenges, um, and then end with a celebration. So the celebration uh, is population aging. Uh, life expectancy is increasing rapidly. Uh, one quick statistic, life expectancy at birth for females in this country was 63 in 1950, 82 in 2010, 86 is expected to be in 2030, 89 in 2050. So huge change uh, in the population uh, um, composition. Uh, and the challenge, the first challenge is that health is not keeping up. So healthy life expectancy and disability free life expectancy <coughs> not at birth, but at ages 65 and 85, are not keeping up with improvements in life expectancy. So the real health improvements that we see at the moment are being experienced by younger rather than older populations. Yet the fastest growing part of the population is the oldest old, those aged 80 plus. So the health challenge uh, is what I want to focus upon. And I want to also focus upon one particular element of that a little bit, which is a big uh, feature in our work at the moment, which is dementia. The fastest growing condition across all diagnostic groups in this country in the last 20 years has been dementia. I'm pretty sure it's going to be the fastest growing in the next 20 years as well. Uh, to give you a statistic, uh, females born in Britain today, so my two granddaughters, have a 30% chance of getting dementia before they die. So the, the proportions are really high. Dementia has no known cure, as far as we know at the moment. So what the other three challenges are how we respond to this. And I'm going to just pick up on uh, three random, really, but others have mentioned other things like integrated care and so on, which I could have said something about. So the first one is technology. Uh, and the question is, can we, re can we replace so-called expensive staff with cheaper digital robotic or other technologies, other solutions to meeting the needs of an older population? And in 10 years, I think the answer is clearly no. I have no optimism about that at all. Uh, there's a huge push for technology from the industry, uh, and it reminds me of the huge push we would saw, see from Big Pharma 20 or 30 years ago. It has lots of similar characteristics, including an almost complete absence of evidence. Um, uh, the gadgets are there. Uh, I forgot this is being video, but anyway, the gadgets are there. Uh, they look wonderful. They will look even more wonderful in 10 years from now. Uh, but as far as an older population is concerned, I just don't think they're going to be uh, the solution. The challenge is not the gadgets. The challenge is getting people to use those gadgets, to accept them, to feel comfortable with them, to feel their privacy is not being uh, impinged and so on. So lots and lots of challenges there. Second challenge uh, in responding to ageing is individualisation. It's already been touched upon a little bit. Uh, individualisation of treatment and care. We've seen this rapid, very rapid development of our understanding of genes, of genetic risks, and a rapid reduction in the cost of gene profiling. Uh, and that has been coupled, or being coupled in many discussions, 
with the evidence we, we have, we've known for a long time, that most interventions are ineffective for most people who take them. So there's a very nice article in New England Journal early this year which analysed the effectiveness of the top 10 grossing drugs in the US. And I quote, for every person they do help, the 10 highest grossing drugs in the US fail to improve the conditions of between three and 24 people. So the top selling statin uh, helps one person but fails 20. That's based on numbers needed to treat. So targeting is really pretty imprecise, which has led to this interest in so-called precision medicine, which I used to call personalised medicine, but I now realise I'm out of date, uh, which is to steer patients to the right drug, or the right treatment anyway, at the right dose at the right time. So the challenge then, I think, is how do we... Uh, exploit these fantastic breakthroughs in understanding genetic risks and these less fantastic but nevertheless interesting breakthroughs in developing biomarkers. How do we harness that uh, in a well-functioning market? And there's all sorts of difficult market failure issues here uh, and also overcome some very tricky ethical issues. So, so I see that as a challenge for the next 10 years. And then the final challenge is, is a bit more prosaic, which is prevention. Uh, and can we prevent many of these needs emerging? And yes, I think we will see improvements over 10 years, but the big challenge is to get people to take responsibility early enough in their lives uh, for, to, to, to have an effect on the risks of developing things uh, when they get to old age, and particularly for dementia. Um, there are lots of things that people can do to reduce a little bit the risk of dementia, but you've got to do it pretty early in your life. So it needs a lot of smart behavioural economists, Adam, to help us work out how we're going to do that. Um, so I think this emphasis will be, will be clear in 10 years' time. Now, how are we going to do that? Reducing the risk of dementia, what do we know? Well, look after your heart health is good. Mediterranean diet seems pretty good. Giving up smoking if you started is good. Exercise is good. Um, but I'm sad to say there's no evidence that wine reduces the risk of dementia. Uh, but despite that, I look forward to toasting the health of Heppel uh, after this event. So thank you very much. Thank you.